Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. You again? What is it this time? Did you start criticizing the world before setting your house in perfect order? Yes, Father. I've been making postmodern neo-Marxist propaganda again, in a relentless quest for power. I can't help it. I just despise Western civilization and meritocracy so much. Please, show me the way. It's like your negativity only breeds misery and chaos. Try having some damn gratitude and create something approximating order in your life. Gosh, you're right. I'm the problem. The complainers are the problem. What's wrong with me? I wish I had your faith in the capitalist free market. I want desperately to believe, but there's just no evidence that anyone but a tiny minority of elites is benefiting from the system. Just give me a sign. My son, faith in capitalism is a choice. You must choose to trust in the market. I mean, without this faith, everything I say would sound utterly ridiculous, ahistorical, and naive. And that's bloody well not gonna happen. Your penance is ten hail markets and an our father. Now change into something presentable and be gone with you. Thank you, Father. Hello, Left Tube, and welcome to Chapter 4. Our friend Jordan Peterson has a lot to say on the topic of religion and Christianity in particular. In fact, his biblical series is over 40 hours long. So it should be no surprise that the Jordan Peterson brand of philosophy is embedded with a rather religious character at its core. Natalie Wynn of ContraPoints explains Peterson's brand thusly. It's all about personal responsibility. Here's how to make your life better, you're in control. Clean up your room. That's a good start. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you. But on the other hand, he's saying, but also, all your problems are the fault of the sinister cabal of intellectuals. Those people are so dangerous, it's almost, you, you almost can't believe it. Because they're not after equity. They're not after tolerance. They're not anybody's friend. Not at all. They're power. They're after power. And that's it. You see, so if you're a radical postmodern neo-Marxist, your theory is human beings can be anything that I want to make them into. It's a core doctrine of the theory, and it's part of what makes it intensely totalitarian, because then human beings are just putty for the molding. And the idea that the purpose of education is to, it's to get them while they're young, you know, in kindergarten, so that this radical postmodern Marxist ideology can be so thoroughly inculcated among people when they're young that they have no chance of escaping from it. Jesus Christ! Somebody should alert the authorities. Obviously, we have a postmodern neo-Marxist in the West. He's climbing in your windows, he's snatching your people up, trying to rape them, so y'all need to hide your kids, hide your wife, and hide your husband because they're raping everybody out here. It's like, what the hell? What's going on? When far-right movements have enemies, they're always simultaneously strong and weak. So this small minority, they're well situated. They have a philosophically driven agenda. They're, they're motivated personally by resentment and power. But there aren't that many of them and they're bloody cowardly. And if you face them down, they'll run away. Why did I tell you that? It's like the devil. He knows he doesn't have what it takes. He's been stripped of his power. The devil is so clever. He knows where to touch you. The devil is so tricky. He knows what buttons to touch. The devil, you know, the devil is strong. He knows how to get you. The devil is powerful. He knows how to get you. The devil is weak. But you think he's strong, so you run to the devil. The devil tricks you. He knows he's not strong. He knows he's not powerful. He knows he's lost all of that. But he uses deception. Satan, the devil, has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And make no mistake about it, he would like to tear apart your marriage. So, Antifa are these super strong thugs who are coming to get you, but they're also soy boys. Women are really weak and stupid but they've also simultaneously manipulated the entire world to revolve around them. Those contradictions work somehow in people's minds because it's not really about having a coherent worldview. It's about restoring a perceived loss of power and status. Peterson is by no means a fascist, 
but this victim-victor dynamic helps us understand why he appeals to people on that end of the spectrum, and why his followers are so primed to get sucked down the alt-right pipeline. But let's circle back to personal responsibility for a minute. Christianity is all about faith and practice. It is an individual's responsibility to pray, to attend church, to give oneself to God, and to lead a good life. Whether or not God blesses you in life or lets you into heaven comes down to your choices and demonstrated devotion. You see, the thing about the Christian doctrine that you referred to is that it makes each individual responsible for their own darkness. Here, Peterson is unwittingly making the point that Marxists have been making for centuries, that religion acts as the lubricant for the maintenance of class societies, mirroring Peterson's own fundamentalist faith in markets, meritocracy, and hierarchy, the Christian language of personal responsibility, faith, and especially the Protestant work ethic serve to mask broader social problems and inequities by teaching devotees to look only inward for salvation. So if there are problems on a larger societal level, it is because not enough individuals are acting responsibly. It's those lazy poor people again. I knew it! What we have then is a crisis of culture and morality that needs to be fixed. Never mind the socioeconomic system that runs and mediates every single aspect of our lives. It's just poor people and immigrants. They're the problem. Marx pointed out that religion had certain practical functions in class society that were similar to the function of opium in sick or injured people. It reduced people's immediate suffering and provided them with pleasant illusions, which gave them the strength to carry on and most importantly, keep working. Those who toil and live in want all their lives are taught by religion to be submissive and patient while here on earth and to take comfort in the hope of heavenly reward. Religion is a sort of spiritual booze in which the slaves of capital drown their human image, their demand for a life more or less worthy of man. Haters can catch me at Gulag. How about that? What do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. In this way, Religion is inherently harmful and reactionary, as it prevents people from seeing the class structure and oppression that surrounds them. If success in life and the afterlife are proportionate to the amount of good behavior and hard work you put in, then we really have no need to examine or question the system itself, because the system is fair. The proper way to fix the world isn't to fix the world. There's no reason to assume that you're even up to such a task, but you can fix yourself. But in his debate with Slavoj Žižek, the sniffling Slovenian Marxist illustrated the stupidity of Peterson's entire philosophy in one fell swoop. Why do you put so much access to this? We have to begin with the personal change, you know, first set your house in order, then. But I have an extremely common sense naive question here. But what if in trying to set your house in order, you discover that? Your house in, is in disorder precisely because the way the society is messed up. It's not enough to tell to your, to your, uh, to your patients, set your house in order. Much of the reason of why they are in disorder, their house, is that. There is some crisis in our society and so on and so on. I hope we agree to say to somebody in, in North Korea, set your house in order, no? Ha <laughs> ha! But I think in some deeper sense it goes also for our society. Zizek then goes on to give us the example of the toothless neoliberal approach to fighting climate change. They tell you, ah, what did you do? Did you put all the coke cans on the side? Did you recycle all paper and so And how this type of false bourgeois activism serves the dual purpose of distracting from broad social critique and absolving the individual of having to think about the problem beyond the most basic level. You say, okay, I do the recycling, so up, you know, I did my duty, let's go on. The beauty of the North Korean statement is in its common sense. Once you accept the blatantly obvious proposition that cleaning your room, standing up straight, and studying hard misses a pretty fucking fundamental aspect of why life in North Korea is pure suffering, then you've understood that systems play a far greater role in determining the quality of your life than individual choice. And once you know that, there's only one thing left to do. But speaking of masking broader social problems, let's move on to another bastion of magical thinking and dogmatic righteousness. The cult 
of liberal, shallow wokeness. In Mark Fisher's essay, Exiting the Vampire Castle, he outlines the five key components that define what he termed the vampire castle, and what I've been calling identity grifting. I want to begin this section by talking about the fourth law of the vampire castle, essentialize. <laughs> While fluidity of identity, plurality, and multiplicity are always claimed on behalf of the Vampire Castle members, the enemy is always to be essentialized. For example, one does not simply make a sexist statement, one is sexist. Their whole identity becomes defined by one ill-judged remark or behavioral slip. Of course, this feature is not exclusive to the Vampire Castle, but what's unique is the apparent contradiction in how they formulate and discuss identity. While on the one hand identities are constructions of the ego and possess a great deal of flexibility, on a systemic or social level they are treated as immutable, fixed in both time and context. Like in religion, such classifications are treated as sacred and universal truths to be applied everywhere, for everyone, for all time. Bruce Jenner is still a man, homosexuality is still sin, the culture may change, the Bible does not. They speak in absolutes, which should be a red flag. If, for example, you are a black woman in the white supremacist social order point system, you are slotted at the very bottom of the pecking order, regardless of your personal experience. Doesn't matter, you are oppressed. You could have grown up in the forest, raised by wolves 3,000 years ago, you're still oppressed by the white supremacist patriarchy. According to Interfem logic, your identity is inexorably defined by the static set of intersectional power dynamics. Well, what about the whites? I'll tell you about the whites. Since white culture is constructed as the norm, white people do not recognize how their race shapes their understanding of politics and their relationship with minority groups. Meaning that, as a benefiting member of the norm, a white guy is inescapably blind to the inherent nature of his white supremacist patriarchal politics because power dynamics mediate his understanding of reality. All white people benefit from racism, regardless of intentions. No one chose to be socialized into racism, so no one is quote unquote bad, but no one is neutral. Racism must be continually identified, analyzed, and challenged. No one is ever done. The question is not, did racism take place, but rather, how did racism manifest in that situation? The racial status quo is comfortable for most whites. Therefore, anything that maintains white comfort is suspect. Resistance is a predictable reaction to anti-racist education and must be explicitly and strategically addressed. Following this line of reasoning to its logical end, all white people are white supremacists. For whites, Racism is the default state. And away from a conversation about the white supremacy that lives and breathes within every single white person standing here right now. Here's what that looks like. Immediately when I got off the elevator, I was told that I couldn't go into the room because I was white. And then I was told that I was allowed to go in, but I couldn't speak, I couldn't express my concerns, and I couldn't make any or ask any questions because I'm white. And I had to stand in the back. The Supreme Court has questioned the Sabrimala Temple's age-old move to ban the entry of women on its premises. The Kerala government has sought time to file a reply. Women are not allowed inside the temple after they attain puberty. Post-menopausal women, however, are allowed. Last year, the ch chairman of Travancore, there was some board which runs Sabrimala, stirred a hornet's nest when he said women should, should be allowed in the temple only after a machine to detect their purity is invented. Let's keep this logic going. If it works for whiteness, what about misogyny, transphobia, and homophobia? If power is our only metric, and you've already got an Excel sheet with trait rankings, like a shitty fantasy football league, then the default state of straight white men is maximum bigotry and blind oppression on all fronts. It is not possible to avoid being socialized into a racist worldview if you're white. It, it's not possible. So to deny it is not going to help you. Now, the sensible thing to do would be to point out that these ideas are almost every bit as racist as the ones they claim to counter, so they pull a sleight of hand and just change the definitions to suit their worldview, usually by adding power 
to the equation. As, as you know, a lot of kids are learning in high school that these days, racism is prejudice plus power. So by definition, a black person or a gay person or whatever, any, you know, cannot be racist or whatever other term because they don't have power, regardless of their social class. This is so. actually being taught. Yeah. I called asking what you thought about that because racism isn't applicable to white people. And I really wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Who says you can't be racist against white people? Well, okay, we have to really take a look at what racism is. Racism should be examining the social, economic, and political system. And within this nation and other Anglo-Saxon nations, there's only one group the in-group, which are white people, that have the political, socio-economic power to oppress people No, totally power. disagree with you. <laughs> I think that's a losing redefinition of racism. There's no question that power dynamics are really important in thinking about whether racism translates into structural oppression, but you can be racist no matter what your race is and no matter what one uh, other people's race is. So for you, the most accurate definition of racism is one in which no one can be racist against white people. Is that what you're saying? That's, it's a, that's, you can't be racist, at least in this nation, in this, in this nation specifically, because that's what I've studied with racism, this nation specifically, you can't be racist to white people because people of color don't have the power. Okay, hold on a second. Just hold, hold on one second, okay? If a Hispanic person says... I don't like white people because they're white. Is that racist? No, it's not racist. And in case you were wondering, this default anti-black racism, you know, the important racism, extends beyond just whites. Uh, so, as a person, as, like, as people of color, we have to recognize that like, we're not black and we do not know the black experience, so we can't really... We have to recognize that also as people of color, we are also anti-black, and we can't speak to anti-black people. Your eyes aren't deceiving you. That's an Asian student. I bet all you non-whites out there thought you were safe from white supremacist biases. Well, think again, sunshine. But as religions go, we're not talking about the Buddhism or Jain sort. We're talking the full-on Abrahamic totalitarian kind, mimicking George Orwell's 1984. I am glad this is not true. Um, the main reason for this, I think, is that it is a totalitarian belief. It is the wish to be a slave. It is the desire that there be an unalterable, unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you are asleep, who can, can, who can subject you, who must indeed subject you, to a total surveillance around the clock every waking and sleeping minute of your life, I say of your life, before you're born, and even worse, and where the real fun begins after you're dead. <laughs> A celestial North Korea. Liam Neeson recently felt this most acutely when he admitted he once wanted to avenge his friend's rape by killing a random black man, but soon changed his mind and felt guilty for it. Big mistake. In today's 1984, simply having once entertained an immoral or bigoted thought at your lowest point is grounds for public shaming and exile. Similarly, in Christianity, doubt is a sin that can send you straight to hell. Forget the sum total of your deeds. You thought a bad thought? Questioned God maybe one lonely night? Game over. This is Orwell's text come to life, except the thought police are women's studies undergrads instead of a right-wing totalitarian state, although that's probably coming too now. So what's the moral of this story? Well, if you've ever felt guilty about anything ever, you damn well better keep it to yourself. It seems healthy. Whatever happened to safe spaces, though? I think Trevor Noah got it right here. I do think it, it, was, it was a powerful admission, though. I think it was cool that he said he looked for help afterwards. I think it was cool that no one bust him, he volunteered the information. I think it was great that he was ashamed. You know, so for me, I, I, that's the world I want to live in. I want to live in a world where a person who says something like that is ashamed of it, and they're telling it to you, not you're catching them out. But a lot of the time I find people are afraid to admit that they ever had a racist thought because then society says you are racist forever and then it, that's it. So there's no value in, in, in atoning, I guess. At least Catholics get the luxury and safety of confession. Not so for identity grifters. Say one bad thing or make the wrong admission and the fourth wave thought police will swoop in and make the arrest quicker than a white woman accusing a black man of rape. In this religion, patriarchy is the origin story. An imaginary ancient matriarchal society is the Garden of Eden. 
Maleness and whiteness are the original sin. Disavowal of privilege and toxic masculinity are the only path to redemption. How to go to confession. Step four, greet the priest. Step five, say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I am a white heterosexual male, so I personally feel that I enjoy a lot of the privilege that a lot of people in this room, in this country, in this world do not. I feel on a conscious and subconscious level that I have benefited from being a white male. I'm white, I'm male, straight, <laughs> um, I'm temporarily able-bodied, and I'm socially acceptable body size, so I just like to check my privilege first. The feminine is divine, infallible, empathetic, egalitarian, incorruptible. Women were more collectivist oriented, egalitarian, all these things demonstrably not true if anyone has ever spent time in a women's organization or lived in a, you know, with a bunch of women. Uh, you know, even the claims around rape, uh, that women never lie about rape and all of that. Well, of course women lie and women are Women are, you know, as faulty as, as human beings as, as men are, and, and women abuse power, and women are violent. Diversity, inclusion, and equity are the holy trinity. Blasphemy is punishable by excommunication. There are some people who, I don't know if they're naive or they're just ambitious, but they always think, I will be the person who the mob doesn't turn on for some arbitrary, stupid reason. I will not make a mistake. That person was only punished because they did something to deserve it. I, I'm good. I will follow all the rules. It's like, honey, there's no escape in the mob. You're the brethren. You're the uh, in-group. You're the saved. You're on your way to heaven. You are supposed to live like a Christian all the time. Evangelism is the path to righteousness. I believe deeply in the critical and audacious goal of eliminating racism and violence in our world. I believe we're all privileged to engage in that work in a learning community that wants to be better. And I believe we have the will to do so. God asked us to do this so we can do this. We can spread God's word through power evangelism. And most importantly, the dogma never questioned. We now see people who are, are lacking religion and searching for it and they're acting out its basic shapes. They're excommunicating people, they're driving purity, they are judging and burning apostates, heretics. The failure to interrogate patriarchy and anti-racism, the failure to interrogate racism and feminism continue to shape modern politics. Now, these consequences are often invisible to the naked eye, and the naked eye is the eye that's not accustomed to looking at issues through an intersectional prism. God's word is the weapon of our warfare to defend our mind, to battle against the assault on our mind that takes place daily. And when you understand how important this is, you can see that the devil is out to get your mind. 24-7, the forces around us push and seduce and compel us to, to participate. And the only way to not collude is to actively, intentionally, and strategically seek to resist those forces. Evil exists. We admit it. It is massive. It is dominant. It is uncontrollable. It is systemic. It is outside us. It is inside us. So an anti-racist frame understands racism as a system. It, while individual players partake in it, it's not dependent on individual players. Right? It's embedded in the fabric of the society, in all the institutions, the norms, the practices, the policies, the, the way that history is told. You cannot go anywhere in this universe without the effects of evil being manifest. Well, let's move to the next factor in our reasoning. One of my goals is to have diversity, equity, race be a part of everything. It's not what you do at 10 o'clock on the agenda and then you move on to something else. You're not uh, a Christian on Sunday and then Monday you live like hell. No, that's not the way it is. Listen, you're a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 366 or 65 days a year. Um, so rather than use defensiveness or emotion, uh, emotion reactions as doors out, use them as doors in. Be excited. Oh, okay, this is totally challenging me. I don't like that at all. Why? What can that help me uncover about the way I make meaning of race? because there is so much depth under the surface. If you are feeling that way, then the Word of God is taking its right effect in your heart. 
Paul wants you to let go of any excuse, dismantle any excuse that you would have before God. So according to the Bible, the Christian life is a war. It's a battle, and that battle is for your mind. And the devil is out to take control of your mind. I believe we are capable of unlearning the habits of mind that perpetuate white privilege. Breaking this cycle will take sustained and stubborn leadership from our administration in at least a doubling of our staff and faculty of color. This I do believe. We are inviting you to come along. We're going to do it. Don't get it twisted. But we would like for you to join us on this road, on this journey. But if you want to be an obstructionist, work on your own. I'd like those of you who are able to join us in saying these names as loud as you can, randomly, disorderly. Let's create a cacophony of sound. Ah! Oh my God, I believe in equal rights. Oh my God, I believe that. I Homophobia shouldn't be allowed. Oh my God, I believe that white men shouldn't dictate a fucking woman's place in the world. You fucking douchebag. You misogynistic pieces of shit. I refuse to let whiteness consume me. And I'm going to say that word explicitly, whiteness. You will not replace us! 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 In no way do I want to suggest that intersectionality or third wave feminism caused the alt-right. Fascist elements have always been lurking behind the scenes of liberal democracy. But in our abandonment of class struggle, we left behind fertile ground for both progressive and reactionary elements to instead engage our material problems with cultural solutions, ushering in a retreat to toothless liberal identity politics. Embracing magical thinking and a rejection of modernity, both camps apply their respective ideological frames to ascribe immutable characteristics to things like race and gender. So while the reactionaries will talk about intelligence, blood, superiority, destiny, criminality, on the other hand, woke progressives talk about static categories of oppression and privilege. Now this isn't to say that cultural analyses aren't important tools, but the further we drift away from material analysis, the more we risk turning into these guys. There is more to this world than materialism. Modernity is characterized by the absence of transcendence and an obsession with purely material concerns. Consumerism, progressivism, a rootless, deracinated existence for all. This channel celebrates and promotes things that cost nothing and bring dignity to our people. I sometimes refer to myself as an elf. First, the aesthetic point, I kind of look like an elf. Now, if we look on Lord of the Rings, who has the highest kill count in the entire fellowship? Yeah, it is Legolas, and then you still have guys who say, oh, he's so gay and everything like that. A real man is determined by his actions and his capacity for uh, violence, strength, enlightenment, how reliable he is. And by the way, if you look up the universal characteristics of cults, you'll notice that I could have just as easily made that comparison. But however you want to describe it, the new woke religion is a perfect mirror image of another leftist subculture, veganism. So I've been noticing some trends here on YouTube land. It goes a little something like this. Vegan, not feeling so good. Eat a little sausage meat. Then vegans attack. Get him! Stacy, I found one. He's not vegan anymore. He's not vegan. Maybe calm down. He was never a real vegan. All I can say is after 10 years trying to make a vegan diet work and it wasn't happening, I went crazy, a little extreme, ate nothing but meat for 30 days, and I just, I couldn't believe the change. Not only in my gut, the gas and bloating went away. I was having weird but normal painless bowel movements in my mind. I was just happier calmer like everything just turned around i was clearly missing something about seven months later i'm finally getting over the vegan outlash bashing finally 
The vegan community came out full force on my exit. Just making response videos, oh, he's a shill. A shill for the meat industry. I was like, please pay me cows, sponsor me. Do you vegans not see it? Like, you're just like, you look like a crazy group of people and anybody who disagrees with you, you attack. It's like, can you imagine that in any other group? Oh, hey, Stacy. Didn't see you at spin class this morning. What, you don't spin anymore? She was never a spinner, ladies. I saw her walk. She walked here. Are you gonna throw something at her? It's beyond the communities of trust thing. It's yeah. a culture of fear and silence. Because rape is a serious thing. And in, when, when we have this affect, where um, if, you, uh, if you, you can't even say, I don't know, without being called a rape apologist, of course it's gonna be hard for you to come forward. Hmm. So it goes beyond that. It goes beyond, the, it's the fact that we've nurtured an affect that doesn't allow people to remain neutral in situations. It's either cancel or be canceled. I think it's complicated and I'm going to, um, I'm gonna throw in here some of the complications that I see. Um, I, I think that people who are marginalized have no sense of trust. Um, yeah, you're talking to a black woman right here. You don't have to tell me that. And, and I'm, I'm you don't sorry have to tell if I'm about marginalization. I'm dealing with marginalization. I'm do it doesn't like it's as if my victimhood doesn't matter. The fact that I'm a black woman doesn't matter. The fact that, you know, I am a victim of abuse, that doesn't matter at all in this whole situation. And that's what really bothers me. And it makes me feel like this whole thing is cynical and it's making me go out of my fucking mind. It's making me go out of my fucking mind because I, I'm not the right kind of leftist. I'm a person of color on the left that doesn't scream about my victimhood all the time. And that bothers people. I had uh, the reason I, 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 it's because I don't perform victimhood in the way people want me to. <clears throat> I don't perform victimhood in the way that people want me to, which is why I'm open season for these kinds of attacks on my personhood. It's fucking painful. You only really see this kind of vitriol in religions. Outsiders are looking at this stuff. It's all happening online, very public here. And they see it and they're like, oh my God, like, is that what vegans are like? I don't even want to try it. You're driving people away from veganism by being so ruthless. It's like, where's the love? So just like when vegans admit to poor health and the need for supplementation or even meat, that represents an existential threat to the community. Just like when Catholics admit they don't believe every little thing in the Bible, that represents an existential threat to true believers and the church. The Christian story is not simply a myth. It isn't just a powerful story that helps us make sense of who we are, although it is that. But in the words of C.S. Lewis, it is a true myth. It is historically reliable and that therefore every single one of us can rest on. I read about 10 books recently, the, the rationality of religion, oh. and everyone's saying it's stupid. Baba ba ba boo ba. You know what's gonna happen to them. <laughs> no, You're gonna be gonna roasting in hell. Come on, roasting. That, that's the old Catholic thing. That's what they taught me. Yeah, I know, I had hell business. Well, come on, the, the, the yeah. standard doctrine that I was taught yeah, as a I, kid. Yeah, that's all gone. That's all finished. <laughs> but that's not fair. Yeah, these are all nice stories, you know. And that doesn't bother you either? Well, that bothers me too. I mean, when everyone's like, <laughs> ooh, we have to have midnight mass because Jesus was born on midnight on 25th. And yeah. This is all nonsense. And so it is for the identity grift. Reddit user Manic Dave puts it succinctly in his hottest of hot takes. It's easy to dismiss a white dude who doesn't like identity politics. However, if a black woman pushes the idea that identity is not a legitimate claim to authority, that's a huge problem. To people who have built an internet persona which is granted power based solely on minority status, leftists de-recognizing that claim is an existential threat that must be wiped out. These people have set out to destroy a woman's life just because they don't want to reckon with the idea that they might just be manipulative arseholes. But the parallels between modern woke culture and religion don't end there. In Christianity, man is made in God's image. He can ascend to heaven. He is special. 
separate from and superior to nature, outside the purview of evolution. Similarly, as intersectional feminists borrow heavily from social construction theory, they view humans as post-biological. Animals may have male and female categories, but humans, our genders, are socially constructed and reinforce dominant culture. Humans, they claim, are a blank slate, different only superficially in terms of reproductive organs. The brain? Exactly the same. So when women and men grow up with different personality traits and interests, it's not because of evolutionary biology, that's stupid. It's because of the socially imposed gender roles. If you argue anything different, you're slandered as a biological essentialist or just sexist. So let me be clear. These are bad ideas because they're wrong. And the data on this is irrefutable. This is one of those things that Jordan Peterson gets right. Uh, just to clarify for you outrage junkies, I'm not saying society doesn't play a role in constructing gender norms. I'm saying that the biology of male and female brains and hormones is a factor, which is what the social constructionists are denying. But that's for another video, comrades. Stay tuned. Marx made a point to say that religion was the opiate of the masses. He was talking to us on the left. What, why are we suddenly forgetting that? Religious thinking turns us into mindless zealots, or Jordan Peterson fans, or market fundamentalists. All people with smooth mayonnaise brains. <laughs> Alright, we're done here. Hit that subscribe button and please consider supporting me on Patreon so I can keep doing this. So, thumbs up if you like the video. Thumbs down if you were raised by wolves, but you still felt the oppressive white supremacist patriarchy consuming your life running with the wolves, jumping off the trees, eating fruits. So thumbs down for that.